Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Okay, so so uh, thanks for the invitation. I imagine that after you know the workshop and so on, like it's, uh, uh, I'll I'll try to keep it short because I I, I don't want to bore you too much after after um, the the workshop. So um, w what I did is um, I'll I'll be talking about the the paper that we presented this year at Infocom, which is about distributed opportunistic scheduling, um, and I plan to like you know, talk about 20 minutes or so about this. Uh, and then I'll, I'll, I have just a few slides um, on other work so that I can convey a, a bit more complete view of the kind of things that we are, we are doing. So uh, basically, uh, opportunistic uh, scheduling techniques, I think that they are uh, widely known to all, all wireless people. So, so the basic idea is to take advantage of the fluctuation of the quality of the channel over time in order to try to schedule stations at the time when the, the quality is good so that you can increase the overall quality. Um, and, okay, that's, that's this, this animation here. So this, this kind of techniques have been, have been around for, for many years now, and I think that they are quite well studied um, and, and developed. Um, the, the thing we are focusing on here is on the distributed opportunistic scheduling techniques, um, which actually have, have raised the attention of the community only, only more recently. So the, the, the point here is that uh, for complexity reasons, for the, the, the way the system is built, we don't have a centralized scheduler, uh, but we rather want to implement um, the opportunistic scheduling in a distributed uh, fashion. And this is actually quite recent work from the, the guys on Princeton that had a, a transaction on information theory and some follow-up works uh, that were basically looking at uh, implementing opportunistic scheduling in a distributed way. And we are basically building up um, on, on this work. So the, the, the concept uh, is quite simple. Basically what you have is uh, the channel time is, uh, is slotted. And what you have is that uh, a slot uh, can either be an idle when no station contains, uh, can have a collision if several stations contain, or can have a success. Uh, what you do is that whenever you contend successfully, instead of transmitting your packet, which is you know, what you would have in, in, in a normal um, uh, channel access, random channel access, what you do is you measure the quality of your channel. If the quality is uh, good enough, uh, meaning that it's above a certain threshold, uh, you transmit your packet. And otherwise, if um, the, the channel quality uh, or the signal to noise ratio basically is below this threshold, you give up your, this transmission opportunity because basically you would not be using um, your channel more uh, uh, effectively, right? I think that's. That's what we have in, in this uh, um, animation, either an idle collision, a successful, we measure the channel quality, which is basically some transmission, right? If it's above the threshold, below the threshold, we don't transmit. If it's above, uh, uh, we transmit. Uh, so basically, the, the, the behavior of the system be depends on the following parameters, which are the access probability with which each station contains um, and uh, the transmission rate thresholds. By the way, I, did, I didn't mention that, but the, the main finding of the Princeton, the Princeton guys is that the best strategy that you can follow with distributed opportunistic scheduling is precisely this um, threshold strategy, and they use optimal st stopping theory to, to, to prove that. Um, so uh, let, let, let me briefly review the, the limitations or the, challenging, the challenges from previous works because this is, uh, is particularly the gap that, that we are closing here. Um, the, what, what the, the, work on, the current work on uh, distributed opportunistic scheduling has done is um, they have um, analyzed the transmission rate thresholds, so basically the threshold above which um, you decide to transmit, 
that optimize performance. And in particular, to, to optimize performance, they uh, look at optimizing the overall throughput in the network. Okay, what, what we are, the, the main limitations are, uh, they are only optimizing the thresholds, and as I've shown in the previous slide, uh, if you want to optimize the overall performance of your system, you have to look at the threshold and at the access probabilities. Uh, uh, second, second problem is that they maximize the total throughput, which actually leads to an unfairness problem because you, you may be starving stations that do not have a good, a good channel. So that's, that's the, the, the second aspect that we are improving. And the, the third one, and I think actually the, 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 the most uh, interesting, is that um, like writing the paper very nicely, but basically what, what uh, uh, previous work did is that they have distributed opportunistic scheduling, but they don't really have a distributed algorithm. So you need to know um, the channel conditions of all the stations in order to compute the optimal uh, uh, parameters. And what we are doing here is we are building a really distributed channel in which you can compute uh, all your parameters based on local information only. Okay, so that's, that's basically our contributions. First of all, we are conducting a joint optimization, solving a joint optimization problem to find the optimal access probabilities and uh, uh, threshold configuration, yeah. So, transmission rate thresholds are optimized locally by the transmitter, mm -hmm. right? Is that, is that the case? Um, uh, not, not necessarily. Um, actually, if, if you look at previous work, in order to optimize the transmission rate thresholds or to find the optimal ones, you need global information. What what will come out of our work, but, but only after, is that we can optimize them locally. But it's not a straightforward at all, and it's not for granted that it's enough with local information to do that. But there's, there's two parties in, in the communication, right? The transmitter and the receiver. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So, so basically, um, that's that's uh, the the first slide. When whenever you uh, successfully access the channel, based on the communication with the receiver, uh, you can measure the signal to noise ratio towards the receiver. Uh, and once you have this measure, you decide whether to transmit a long packet or not. Uh, okay. So I misunderstood. Is the slot a transmission and acknowledgement slot, or is it just a single direction? Mm -hmm. Oops, sorry, is that mine? I, I thought I, let me put it in mute. I thought it was in mute. Um, yeah, that's, that's, that's a good point. Um, and, and actually it's, it's something that we've, we've been discussing. So necessarily, if in, in that system, what you have in a successful contention is typically like if, if we were thinking of 802.11, you'd have an exchange of RTS, CTS. So, so really, um, in here, um, when you have a successful contention, that should, that should be a longer uh, slot than if you have an idle or a collision, right? Uh, in, in this model, uh, we, sh we just took a duration tau for all slots. Uh, main reason being that uh, we didn't want to change the model of the Princeton guy on the transactions on information theory uh, in order to, you know, to, to be able to compare to them. Okay, but we've also, and we, we did basically both analysis and we were looking at what would happen if we have um, a longer duration here and results are very similar uh, for the main reason that basically the advantage you have out, out of playing this with the opportunistic scheduling is how a contention compares to an actual transmission. And even if you take the, the, the physical layer of a wireless LAN, an RTS-CTS exchange is still much smaller than a packet transmission. So, uh, and, and we are taking a ratio of 1 to 10, which is quite similar to wireless LAN. So, um, 
it's, that's something that we've been discussing for long and at the end we decided not to change the, the file layer mo uh, model of the Princeton guys, although for some wireless systems uh, what you're saying is right and we may actually have different timings. Is that clear? So, so that's, that's, that's a very good question. Um, uh, um, our, our goal, I mean, we, we don't have anything against exchanging information, uh, but we want to build something that can be practical and efficient. So, for instance, if, if you look at some previous works, like they, they have an iterative algorithm that requires, like, you know, um, it, it takes, like, uh, thousands of iterations to converge, and each iteration is exchanging one message with another station. So we'd, we'd like to, say, to have something as simple as efficient as possible. It, it turns out, as, as we will see later in the algorithm, that just listening to your channel is sufficient and you don't need to exchange any explicit signaling. Uh, but there's nothing that we, we have against ex exchanging information, just that if we can avoid it and make the system more efficient, uh, that's, that's better. But it's, it was not necessarily a goal to avoid it. Uh, okay, but as you'll see later, I think this, the, the answer will become very clear. Um, it's, it's, you, you, you don't really need to change anything, and it's, it's just enough to, to listen to the channel and see, and see what's going on. Okay, so, so um, the, these are the, the parameters that we, we want to optimally configure, and then we want to build an adaptive algorithm that, uh, as I said, uh, based on as little information as possible, is, is able to... Um, converge to, to this uh, optimal configuration, and for that we are going to, to use a control theoretic analysis. The goal is not so much to use control theory, but really to converge as quickly as possible and to, and to be as stable as possible, and that's where, where control theory helps a lot. What does it mean optimal in the context of mm -hmm. as well? Mm -hmm. so, what, what, what do you have to Yeah, um, uh, so that, that comes in the next slide, yeah. Um, but yeah, maybe I should not talk about optimal. Here we, we just need some configuration and we'll see which one. Um, so so this is, this is um, actually answering your question. So for us, optimally, and I think that it, that's, that's very common for opportunistic scheduling is a proportional fairness. So, so we, we wanna maximize the sum of logs uh, precisely for the reason I was saying before about, about you know, having a good trade-off trade between fairness and, and total performance. Uh, I will not bore you with, with the uh, uh, maths, but if we look at the access probability, actually the, the analysis is not too difficult. Um, you always um, want to ensure when, whenever you have a, a random access that the sum of the probabilities is equal to one, uh, because that, that, that's for sure you can have any distribution you want and, and that's, that's always optimal. Um, and that means basically that the, the empty probability always needs to be one ovary. Uh, so that's, that's some kind of invariant in our case. Um, and the, the question is, um, how the, what's the ratio between access probabilities uh, as long as they sum one? And this you get simply by making the derivative of the log of the throughputs. Um, and actually you get uh, quite a simple expression, uh, which is this one, so basically, uh, what we have here is um, a, a system of equations, um, and the optimal access probabilities are the ones uh, that solve this system of equations. Um, the, the hidden point here is that um, the ratio between access probabilities depend on this um, capital T's, which is basically the average time a station uses the channel um, after uh, uh, contending successfully. So basically, if you decide not to uh, use your transmission opportunity, uh, then the, the time that you use the channel is just the time that you s you've spent in the contention. Uh, if you decide to use your transmission opportunity, we are talking here about um, the time of the transmission, uh, uh, right? So, so 
it, the point is that uh, this ratio between access probability um, depends on the transmission rate threshold, which is basically how, of, uh, uh, how often you use your transmission opportunities after a successful contention. Mm -hmm. uh, because it maximizes the sum uh, of the logs of the throughput. That's subject to constraints, so eventually they boil down to throughputs being equal across time. Uh, sorry, you can. I understand, so you have an objective function, but what are the constraints we have in place? If they have simple constraints, then the optimal will be just the t equal rates to each i. Um, and you seem to be getting like pi times this pi mm -hmm. equalized. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so the, the the point here, um, I'm not sure I'm getting your question right, is that um, different stations have different channel conditions, right? So, so uh, um, it's if if a station has worse channel conditions, and you give the same um, access probability to both the stations, there's one station with worse channel conditions uh, that. Um, maybe using the channel for more time, making a, a, a worse use of it. So um, it's not the, necessarily the case that all the stations have the same access probability. Not, not sure if I'm making myself so clear. Sub, su subject to, so, sorry, subject to? Some constraint set. Like it could be like if you have a single link, it could be all our eyes, they need to be at most C, some number. Yes. Okay. I mean that it is still under that R I, the, the R I's are physical. Right? Exactly. So, some so. Physical set, for example, yes. the capacity is at most C, so, so some. Mm -hmm. of okay, yeah, I, C, yeah, so yeah, I. I get your point um, here. Okay, okay um, we we didn't need to to express it like this because otherwise, of course, you know, RIs would be infinity. But it's basically here the the underlying constraint that we have is is the channel, right? So so basically we have a ch we have a channel with this, we, they are all sharing the same channel time, and there's there's some bandwidth in that channel that basically limits based on their the SNR that the, each station is getting upon accessing the channel, uh, what's the throughput that they get, right? So, so that's, that's the constraint that is, is we, we didn't need to express it explicitly, um, uh, precisely because, you know, we are, we are getting a, a relationship, but this is basically, this is optimizing that, that uh, problem with these constraints that are very similar to the ones you are saying, which is the ones that you would typically have in a wired uh, um, link, right? So, so the, the point is that um, if we know the transmission rate threshold that each station is using, we'd be able to compute the optimal access probabilities, uh, but that's part of the problem that we want to solve to, to get the optimal th transmission rate thresholds. Um, and that's what we, we solve in this theorem. I would not go into the, uh, uh, the, the proof, but I'll just try to explain the, the meaning. So um, the the transmission, the optimal transmission rate threshold of a station K is the same one that this station would have if it was alone in the channel, so if it was using the channel alone, um, and it was contending with this access probability. Right? So, so we get like a very simplified problem, which is one station alone, a certain access probability. Um, we, if we are able to compute the optimal threshold in, in that scenario in which there's one station, uh, this is the optimal threshold that the station will be using even when it's sharing the channel with many other stations. Okay, that's what, what this, this uh, uh, theorem is saying. Can you give a little bit more intuition because mm -hmm. that, yeah. that, 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 mm -hmm. that doesn't kind of yeah. capture somehow how many other stations yeah, the, the, the intuition is, is, is the following. Um, basically, what I said before is that um, the, the um, empty probability is equal to 1 over E in the optimal configuration, okay. right? 
basically this means that uh, bef before every transmission, so I have basically one over E, uh, uh, or so, sorry, E minus one empty slots, and then I have a transmission. In average, I have E minus one plus a transmission. So basically, what you are going to have in your channel is always E minus one, uh, a successful contention, E minus one empty slots, a successful contention, and so on. Um, if, if we go to the previous, the, the ratio between access probabilities, basically what um, that is saying is that if I consider that the channel time consumed by a station is the channel time it's using plus this overhead that I have be before every contention, uh, all stations are allocated the same channel time exactly. with, with this definition of channel time which is including overhead. Okay, so so, no, no, no. This. <laughs> no, no. This is this is um, the optimal threshold of a given station. Okay, uh, independent on the other stations it's sharing the channel with. Okay, and the intuition maybe I I was trying like to explain the the outline of the proof, maybe if I try to explain the intuition uh, with another argument, the intuition is basically that um, if the optimal threshold uh, basically is a trade-off between the time that I waste on a contention that is, that, that is successful but that doesn't lead to a transmission because that's some wasted time and the time that I waste if I decide to access the channel but my transmission rate is low, right? It's, it's a trade-off between these two. The first one, which is, you know, the time it takes until you manage to get a, a contention successful is pretty independent of the number of stations that you have in the channel. This comes from the fact, from the way that the MAC access protocol is designed, right? The way that mm -hmm. the and, and, and that is constant. I mean, so the protocol is designed so that that is constant. Right. You waste some channel's capacity to make sure that the system works. Mm -hmm. Right. But there is a second step in which you say, okay, well, if I have, obviously, two nodes, it's a different story than if I have 100 nodes mm -hmm. in that network. So if I have 100 nodes, I will get less of the channel. And that, I guess that it would have come a bit after mm -hmm. in, in your formulation. But you agree that basically the efficiency of the contention is pretty much independent of the number of nodes, right? Okay, so, so then uh, the, the threshold does not depend that I have more channel time or less, but it depends only on how efficiently I have the channel time that I, I have allocated to me. So if I have 100 times less channel time, I still will use the same threshold because it it, the, the trade off that it depends on, which is the efficiency of the contention versus the efficiency of the transmission, is still the same no matter how much channel time I have. Okay. Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah. I'm a bit confused whether this R is actually the rate at which <laughs> you will actually get access to the effective rate at which you use the channel, or <laughs> the rate for which you will actually compete for the channel. Um, yeah, the, the, really yeah, it's, that yeah. Where does the big end comes into mm -hmm. Yeah, I, maybe I, I didn't explain the, the, the notation clearly enough. So basically, this is uh, the bit rate, the, modul the bit rate of the modulation scheme that you are using for a certain channel quality. Okay, okay? so basically, um, when at, at, at time theta, uh, depending on the, the, the channel conditions, uh, I can use a certain modulation coding scheme. Okay? If this modulation coding, coding, coding scheme is above a certain threshold, I transmit. Otherwise, I don't transmit. So maybe what was confusing you is the definition of capital R, which is the modulation coding scheme and not really the throughput that I'm having for which we are using the small r. So that's, that's probably a terminology problem. Um, so basically the, the, the nice thing of this equation, and, and, and that comes from a previous question, is that it depends on local information only. 
So uh, this depends on my channel conditions. This is the, the number that I want to compute. And these, are, these depend on local conditions only. So, so the nice thing here is that uh, the thresholds, which according to some previous works, like required to know, uh, to have global information of the network, in our case, you only need to, to monitor your channel and you can compute your, the optimal threshold on, only with your channel. So based on that, what uh, our algorithm does is, uh, we based, based on local information, we compute the optimal threshold. And then the channel, the, the challenge is to compute the, the um, optimal access probabilities um, uh, for which we are going to, to use an adaptive algorithm. And, and here we'll have to interact with the other stations. But for the threshold, it, we only need to monitor our, our channel. So to do that, um, what we are going to do is um, uh, uh, use a, a very simple controller uh, which is basically a proportional controller. And what we are going to do is we monitor the empty probability. So that's the only information we need to monitor from the channel, the, which is the probability that the channel is empty. Uh, we compare it with the optimal value, which is basically 1 over e. And that's the error signal that we fit into our um, controller. And then our controller signal will, will be the, the access probability that we are using. So the control effectively comes from the fact that you basically, OK, now get it. Mm -hmm. so that you compare the optimal empty probability with the, the observed one. Exactly. So you end up based on that. So this is where it can, where here, you know, the whole idea of having more nodes comes into play. Uh, this is the variable over which the, mm -hmm. the nodes communicate with each other. Exactly, exactly. So the, the, you, you assess the behavior of the other stations based on the empty probability of the channel. If the other stations transmit a lot, the empty probability will be smaller. So, so that's, that's the, the, the implicit communication between stations. So that's the, the output signal, the reference signal, and the, and the proportional controller and the, and the control signal. Um, so what, what we are doing is um, we are measuring, this is the linearized system, but it's basically the, the, the same one as before. Uh, we are monitoring the, the empty probability in order to basically have the average empty probability, which, was, which is what we are interested uh, on, we use a low-pass filter, which basically is sliding, sliding window. Uh, then we have our controller, and, and this is our system. Um, and, and the challenge here basically is to, is to compute the, the, um, proportional, uh, the, the proportional constant of the, of the controller. Um, so, so this will be to, to show local stability. Exactly, yeah. Um, so, so, so with that, we only guarantee local stability. Um, and then by a simulation, we show that the, st the stability is, is global. Uh, but we, we, don't, we don't actually, I mean, with this kind of systems that are, very, are not linear, uh, we cannot really guarantee, uh, or it's very difficult to guarantee global stability. So we use, uh, I think, like, you know, quite a bit of theory and control theory of um, small signals that, that basically just guarantee local, local stability. So you don't know on the theory side whether there is a unique or there is multiplicity of uh, peaks points, it's not limit points or peaks points. Um, uh, so we have uh, what you're, you're talking uh, of the solution of the system. Uh, I mean, the initial, the way the problem was formulated, so you may ask, I'm looking for fixed points of this. Mm -hmm. Um, so I'm not sure I'm following. So the, our system of equations, which would be like the only stable solution of the system, that's unique, right? But that doesn't guarantee necessarily that we have global stability in the sense that um, even if there's only one solution, uh, depending on how we set our, our, our constants, we could be still oscillating, right? So we will not converge to another one. Exactly. So we guarantee that we don't go into a different one, but we don't guarantee that necessarily that we don't oscillate out of the theory. So the theory just proves that there's local stability and that there's a unique solution. Uh, and then, you know, like theoretically, you could probably, you know, devise some 
very strange system that is still like, you know, satisfies all these mathematical properties, but still shows oscillations. Um, so so the, the challenge is to compute the, the, the constant of our uh, controller precisely to ensure stability or local stability, to be more correct. Um, see, what, what the trick we are doing here, um, in, in, in one of the slides at the end on another work, we are tackling the same problem from a different angle, um, is uh, basically since uh, we want to ensure that there's this proportionality between access probabilities and the access probability is precisely our uh, um, uh, control signal which is proportional to the output uh, of the controller. What we do is um, we set our um, pro uh, uh, the, the proportional, the proportional um, controller uh, of a station I to a value that is common for all stations, which we call KPI, plus this value that is precisely the ratio between access probabilities. In this way, if KP is the same for all stations, we ensure uh, that this ratio is uh, preserved. Um, and in this way, uh, mainly, mainly our channel is, uh, challenge is just to set KP, the, 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 this constant. And the point is that if we set it too large, the system will be unstable. If we, if we set it too small, it will react too slowly to changes. Um, so then what we do is uh, we lin linearize the system. Um, and based on the linearized system, we try to find a good um, uh, value for this, uh, this parameter. Uh, that, of course, I mean, the poles need to be inside the unit circle. And then we use the, the Ziegler-Nichols rules, which are like very simple rules uh, that give you a, a fairly good uh, setting for, for this. Um, and then, you know, this is the, the stability, so, so, so um, the maximum value for KP. Actually, if, if you do that, uh, and, you know, initially when I was doing this work, I just did that, we tried it out, and, and it it seemed that it, it, it was oscillating, uh, which was a bit struggling to me. Uh, the, the main reason is that in, in addition to um, the, the system behavior, here we have a lot of noise. And the noise basically comes from the empty probability uh, that we, we'd like, like to ensure that it's one over in average, but basically it's zero one, so the deviations between the expected empty probability and the values of zero, one, that's, that's like noise in our system. Uh, and we want to make sure that this noise um, is, um, is, is, is uh, su sufficiently um, removed from our system. So in order to do that, um, what we need to, to ensure is, for instance, if we want that the noise in the output signal is one-tenth or, or you know, 5% of, of the average signal, we need to impose another condition, which is that KP is sufficiently small so that we are also um, filtering sufficiently the noise that we have in our system, which is a totally different issue from stability. Um, and with, with this analysis, basically we are analyzing the, the, the power of the noise. Uh, we, say, we set KP to the minimum of these two conditions to ensure that we are uh, having a system stable and that we are uh, removing noise. So once we've done it, Um, okay. Uh, uh, so yeah, that's 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 a good point. Um, uh, typically, when when we apply this this kind of things, it can be that it depends on some system parameters, and then you need you need to take the the worst case, right? Uh, uh, in, in this particular case, uh, if I recall properly, it didn't, yeah, um, I think that it didn't, it didn't depend on the system parameters. At least it didn't depend on the number of stations, if, if I'm not wrong. I would, I would need to check the paper though, because I don't, I don't remember exactly. Um, uh, so, so in this case, we didn't have the problem. In other cases, like, uh, one of these slides I'll present later about another paper. It, it did depend, for, for instance, on the number of stations. 
uh, the, the worst case for the number of stations was one because it, it, like, it had an increasing dependency. So then we, we, like, we went to that worst case uh, because it's the only thing that, that you can really do. Does this answer your question? Yes, because I'm a VM writer. Know that it has to be KB has to be sufficiently small, and then you wonder how much smaller. Mm -hmm. Now maybe you have numerical means to compute this upper bound, but then this is maybe insightful to tell me, you know, if it's smaller than two or five or something more. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Unfortunately, I I don't I don't remember by heart the the, the expression. Um, so so let me let me quickly go. Um, I'm going a bit over time, but there are questions. So if, if, if you want me to speed up, that just say it. So just just some simulations to to give some hints. Um, so so here we are basically um, comparing ourselves against um, previous approaches, non-opportunistic and the optimal configuration. Uh, bottom line is that uh, we achieve a good trade-off. Like you know, you can see that this is uh, uh, quite unfair. Uh, so here we have like this trade-off that, that results from proportional fairness, and of course we improve substantially over non-opportunistic uh, uh, by the fact that uh, you know we, we are um, uh, using the channel more efficiently. Uh, an interesting fact, and actually one of the motivations for the algorithm uh, that I didn't mention before is that um, we've, we've devised the algorithm to, to work well under non-saturation, which in many cases, like uh, uh, many algorithms are devised just for the saturation case, which is when stations always have packets to transmit. Uh, here, what we are doing is we are uh, driving the system so that the, the empty probability is one over E, no matter whether stations are uh, uh, transmitting up to their load rate or not. Uh, so basically, uh, what many, many approaches would do is that if there are many stations on the channel, uh, but they are not um, uh, using it as much as they can, uh, they would uh, be over conservative because they would be using too small access probabilities. And here we are adapting to the actual um, uh, use of the channel. And by that, you can see that you know, the, the performance uh, improvement is quite substantial. What do you assume about uh, in, the, in that experiment about mm -hmm. how users are acting on it? Um, because, I mean, you know, typically in practice, on mm -hmm. top you may have something like TCP, which right. is yet another concept, mm -hmm. which will depend on what you do underneath. So, you can, you know, so is, do you assume that, that, that in this experiment that the nodes kind of transmit something with some constant probability, mm -hmm. or is there any kind of TCP-like controller on top? No, no. Um, so we, we didn't look into any TPC, TCP controller. Typically, the, experien the experiments that we've done with, with TCP is that uh, it behaves pretty much as saturation. So, so with TCP... Not, not really, right? If the application is using TCP, but it is not really trying to saturate... Okay, that's true, yeah. That yeah, yeah, things can yeah, complicate yeah, yeah. because mm -hmm. the application may want to send data, Right. but it may sense that the channel is actually mm -hmm. over busy, so it yeah. back off. Okay, no, we didn't do that experiment. So what, I, what experiments that we've done is basically with TCP, but with FTP kind of transmissions. And there the saturation model works pretty well. Uh, he, here we were not, uh, what we did is um, stations were using half of the saturation rate. Okay, so, so they were like it's UDP kind of applications and at a certain rate that is below the, the saturation rate. It'd be interesting to see what happens with TCP. I'm, I, I'm not really sure how, uh, what would happen, but maybe for an extension, that's something we can look at. Um, and, and here is what uh, I think that uh, I was being asked before, so you know about the setting of the controller and speed of reaction. Uh, interesting thing, thing here is that um, actually it seems that our setting of KP um, is quite good and this, this parameter, like the performance of the system is quite sensitive of this parameter. So if we just say, set it uh, 10 times larger, the system becomes unstable, as we can see here, so the access probability. And only 10 times smaller, you look at here, basically this is load time, you, you look here, you know, the reaction of the system and it, be, it becomes really, really slow. So, so you know, it's, it's really necessary and it's not easy to, to find this good trade-off between reaction to changes stability and control theory help uh, quite a bit. 
Um, so with, with that, I conclude my, my talk. The, the contributions basically is the joint optimization, the adaptive algorithm, and, and the control theoretic analysis. Um, and I'd like just to spend um, three, three slides on other words just, just to convey a, bit, a little bit other things that we are doing. Um, this is something that we presented in the mini conference at Infocom. Um, basically, what we were looking at here is what we call boy piggy, which is basically if we think of voice over IP over wireless LAN, it's quite inefficient because you have voice packet, the acknowledgement, and then in the opposite direction, which you know it's exactly synchronized um, um, and, unless you have um, silent suppression, which which Skype and so on do, do not use. You always have, like, with the same rate, voice packet and acknowledgement. Voice packets, as you know, are, are very slow, uh, very very small. So basically, you're you're transmitting four, pretty much four packets when you could simply do with with two. So what what we are proposing here is simply to this this voice packet that goes on the opposite direction at the same rate, just um, a, a piggyback it to the acknowledgement. A, a nice thing here is that. Um, I mean, th there are many proposals with a similar flavor, I'd not say exactly like that, uh, but that we've gone and implemented it in, in, in the firmware of the Broadcom card. So basically, with a collaborator from Brescia has been able to reverse engineer the, the Broadcom cards, and we were able to implement it in, in the firmware and, and really try it out. Um, and, and, you know, performance improvements are very significant. So if we have only voice traffic, we are pretty much able to, to double the number of uh, uh, voice calls that we can support. Uh, Why voice? I mean, even regular TCP connections from which we have the acknowledgement maybe could somehow benefit from something like that. Um, so so, so uh, you're saying because you could piggyback the TCP act or? Yes. Okay. Yeah, that's actually, um, uh, so, so this is being developed in a project with the people, um, with Giuseppe Bianchi's group. Uh, and they've done also, you know, building on this this capability of um, touching the firmware. They've been trying this out. So, so they, they've, I think they, they presented that on Infocom as well, uh, the the TPC piggybacking, um, and they have also at, at Connex, I think, a follow-up paper. Um, but if I'm not wrong, they are not investigating really TCP performance as such. But it's just an example of um, the, the, the framework that they are building. Yeah? So I, I guess it's like a fusion is also the TCP have a bi-directional connection and TCP will piggyback uh, the acknowledgements in the reverse data part. But what you're talking about here is um, sort of uh, MacLayer apps, right? Mm -hmm. so, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, so I think that if I'm not wrong, you were talking about TCP as some other application of, a sim of piggybacking. But here, I'm not talking about TCP at all, and the acknowledgments are layered to acknowledgments, are wireless and acknowledgments. So there's, here, I don't have TCP at all. So the idea would be to take the TCP out and send them the same packet as, send them the same framework, layer two out. So what, what Christos is saying is that if this was a, tip, tip, a TCP uh, packet, Okay, you would have something similar because you would have the, the TCP act sent back as a different frame, right? And what you could do is use the same idea and piggyback the TCP acknowledgement here. But that would be doing a similar, applying a similar idea to TCP, uh, but that has not really, nothing really to do with that. Do you, do you see what I'm saying? Okay. Um, Okay, so, so uh, another piece of work, um, uh, uh, very recent, this, this has been very recently accepted at Connex and it's actually going through this Shepherd uh, uh, process is, is the power consumption. So basically what, what we've been doing is uh, we've taken um, A22.11 devices and tried to understand uh, the power consumption behavior uh, when transmitting over the, the wireless channel. So basically what we've done, I mean, it, it was not easy uh, because many works that have been done so far basically analyze only the wireless card and we, want, we wanted to analyze the behavior of the, of the entire device. 
um, it, which, which actually we got the most interesting results from that. So um, bu building a system to, to measure that was, was not easy because the resolution errors that you have in most devices were not sufficient. So we had to use error analysis in order to, a, to be able to uh, develop a, a measurement system that was sufficiently accurate. And then um, we, we analyzed uh, the, different, the, the, the energy consumption of the different components. Um, and it turned out that um, just crossing the protocol stack with has nothing to do with the, the actual consumption in the wireless card. Uh, it consumes a very, very substantial part of the energy. So building on that, basically, we've developed a new convenient model um, that matches uh, the, the actual behavior uh, of, of wireless devices uh, 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 quite well. And we've come up with some uh, practical implications. Basically, uh, we've taken some mechanisms that have been proposed in the literature to um, reduce energy consumption. And we've seen that in light of the new model, uh, they don't really provide the expected gains or you know, they may even consume uh, more energy than if you were not applying them. Uh, and also we've been able to come up with new mechanisms that uh, are derived from uh, this model and that allow to, to reduce energy. So this I'm discussing with the Qualcomm guys because some of the experience we've done with the Theros uh, and they seemed quite interesting in, in seeing how to, how to apply these this results to their equipment. Um, the, the very last comment I'll, uh, I'll make is um, uh, another work uh, that we published last year in Transactions on Mobile Computing basically was looking at something similar to what I described here on adjusting the, 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 uh, the access probability or the contention window of um, 802.11 devices. But rather than playing the tricks that we were, I was doing here, which basically I was using control theory, but um, I had multiple stations. But in our analysis, we, we only had one control loop. We only had one station. Uh, what, what we did here is really tackle the problem from a multivariable control theory, uh, which means you know, uh, control theory with multiple variables. And this, um, as far as I know, I haven't seen networking papers using these tools. I've seen many papers using uh, single variable control theory, but multi multivariable control theory. Uh, um, I mean, I want to be cautious with this statement, but I think it's, it's the first one that I know of. So there, there might be many papers I have not read, but I, I haven't seen it. Um, nice thing about this, this algorithm is that um, we, we, impl we have implemented it in, in our FloorNet testbed, which is basically one, one underneath. And what we've seen is that just introducing a bit of code in, in the um, drivers of the wireless devices, uh, we can really improve uh, our performance very substantially. So in, in normal situations, like easily 10, 20, even 30%. Uh, but if we have um, like hidden nodes or other situations, improvements are, are more dramatic. And we've, we've tried this in a quite variety of situations, and even for, for the practical scenario, uh, improvements seem to, be, seem to be quite satisfactory. Uh, so just wanted to give a very brief um, outline of other works that, that we do um, in addition to what I presented. So I think I <laughs> took a bit more time than I expected. <laughs>